You ready? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Here we go. Popping corks with Tommy today. Uh, we are <laughs> Tommy. Uh, Tommy works. Thomas works at uh, local wine shop, and we have uh, been friends for a while. We uh, have traveled yeah. uh, to wine country together, and uh, today we are we are going to uh, challenge ourselves a little bit with some some wines from different places. Um, it is uh, still January, so my theme this month is. Um, Forget about dry January, it's try January, so we're gonna try some new things. Um, in fact, we're gonna try a new wine in just a second uh, that came to in the mail today, this morning, from a new region, a new, new well, not a new region, but a new production from an old region. And then uh, we're also gonna try some uh, wines from the Loire Valley, some Cabernet Franc, in fact, from the Loire Valley, so not a place that a lot of people get to try red wines or, or go to for red wines sometimes, but we like the, the region and the wines. And then- um, Love the region. Love the region. Love the region. Beautiful region. Um, and then we're going to uh, blind ourselves on a couple wines and challenge each other with uh, something a little, a little different. So let's try um, a new category of wine. Just approved literally in the last year or two. Um, this is Prosecco Rosé. Tommy, do you know anything about Prosecco Rosé? I don't know anything about Prosecco Rosé because this is a new thing. Um, so this is something uh, new to market, essentially. So, Brian, what are you going to tell me about Prosecco Rosé today? <laughs> so Prosecco Rosé is uh, Prosecco that is pink. And many people are really like, well, I've had pink Prosecco before. it. Um, in fact, actually, you, you haven't unless you've had it within the last month or two because it's only really started to come to the United States since November or been allowed to really and this is really one of the first bottlings that I've seen. Uh, do you have any in the store? Uh, no, I do not have any of that in the store. You plan to get any? Not this one, but any Prosecco Rosé at all? I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think I, I don't think we would say no to anything like that. Right. Um, I mean, there we have I have, I have Italian sparkling rosé. I don't right. have Prosecco rosé. Yeah, so that's, um, the, that's the thing. I think there's a lot of... A, confusion a, with that, probably. Exactly. Yeah. And people think that, um, you know, Prosecco is such a big category. I think people think that the grape variety is Prosecco. It's referred to as Prosecco. But actually, with Prosecco, the grape variety is called Galera, G-L-E-R-A. And um, that has been the grape that has been used to make Prosecco for many years. And since 2010, they really had to kind of up the ante with with controlling uh, uh, the the knockoffs, the fakes, and the and the copycats out there uh, for prosecco because it was kind of getting abused as the reputation and the demand for prosecco kind of increased about ten years ago. And so the DOC was created and the DOCG was created for prosecco. Um, but it's taken about ten years now for rosé to come along, and now with the popularity of rosé, um, I think it makes sense. And, and certainly the producers in, in the prosecco region wanted to. Uh, capitalize on that a little bit. Um, so just the basics here, it is a DOC and it is now official. Uh, Prosecco Rosé as a category has to have Glera as uh, the main component. In fact, you're allowed to blend in Pinot Noir, 10 to 15 percent Pinot Noir. There you go. Yeah. Rock and roll. Where else in sparkling world do they use Pinot Noir? Uh, champagne. Right. Yeah. So key component in champagne and a lot of sparkling wines around the world. Um, and it sort of makes sense then, so to use it in, in Prosecco because um, Pinot Noir has, obviously it has a color, you know, it's a red grape, um, but it has great fruit and right. it has acidity. So all those things are kind of things that you're going to want to find and, and taste and enjoy in Prosecco Rosé, I think. So. Yeah, I'd say so. Are you ready to... That's all the things that you want in affordable sparkling wine in general. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Rock have you have you tried Prosecco Rosé yet? No, this is this is gonna be my first. This is gonna be my first trial. All right, let's right try here. try January. Yeah, try yeah. January. Cheers. Cheers. What does it smell like? It's definitely got more red fruit than I, so. I would expect out of prosecco. Standard you, prosecco. You, you said grapefruit, now it's standing out, man. I said red fruit and a little grapefruit too. I guess yeah, it's got a little bit of that citrus quality. Um, ripe fruit, yeah, that's right. A little bit like uh, the red fruits are like strawberry, cherry. It's a little, little almost tart red fruit. Cherry, Acidity. strawberry, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, not the brightest acidity, but no. I think it works. Yeah. It does. It's a, it's a little rounder. I mean, you know, the, the beauty about Prosecco is Prosecco has that sort of like classic melon pear 
slightly sweet, off dryish kind of appeal to it. It's frothy, it's fruity, right. um, goes great with a lot of foods like lunch foods and whatnot. Um, and I think this kind of hits the mark as a nice little counterpoint to that. It's probably a little drier. Um, it's got a little bit more texture, I think, than a lot of Prosecco has. Um, so in that, it's maybe a little more serious, perhaps. Right. But definitely easy to drink. Um, this bottle is is not completely chilled, so I think we're getting a little bit more fruit expression in the aromatics, perhaps. But um, yeah, I think if it was chilled and and, and uh, um, served the way you would normally get it, uh, say in a restaurant or whatnot, yeah. it's gonna be nice and crisp and fresh. It's clean, it's easy drinking, so I don't have a problem big, with that. Big thing that I always go back to, especially lately, um, you know, um, what's, I mean, as Brian knows, um, <clears throat> once you're, you know, in the wine business for um, some time, you find yourself trying to, like, figure out about new wines or new things that you would enjoy or kind of like, okay, let me try something else out or let me try, let me find out what's going on in Uruguay. Um, and every once in a while we find wines that we love and then you try your friends on it who aren't in the wine business or people that don't do this, you know, this craziness um, for a living. And they're like, okay, that's cool. But like, what's going on there? So my big thing is lately, I, I, I tell, you know, customers at the shop is it's accessible and this is super accessible. You know, you put it in a glass, you give it to somebody that, you know, is work does not work in the industry um and does not make you know uh fermented grape juice their entire life uh and do they get it yeah is it simple yes is it delicious yes um will your mom get it yeah absolutely uh yeah, mom, would so, mom would love this right yeah. yeah absolutely so um accessible uh simple approachable wine so accessibility is a big thing you might yeah that's a, that's like totally the thing about prosecco i remember the first time i had prosecco was was in italy 20 years ago it was with somebody we went out to lunch and they're like, have you ever had Prosecco? And I'm like, not really. No. And so we had a glass of Prosecco. I have no idea what it was. It was just at a cafe in Rome. And, you know, we were having... This 20 years ago? This was, yeah. Yeah, actually. Wow. And, um... The yeah. thought of being in the wine business and being able to say, like, no, I, I can't say I've had Prosecco. You know, that's like... That's yeah, nuts. It's totally shocking. But yeah. yeah, there was a time before Prosecco. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at least. At least in my world. Um, but, but... Uh, you know, we had salads and pizza or something like that, yeah. and and glass of prosecco. I think we probably killed the bottle, but you know, at at uh, a modest alcohol content, um, pretty simple, easy, just frothy, right. fresh wine. It's perfect for lunch, and you know, I know a lot of people like to drink prosecco because it's pretty inexpensive and yes. it's fresh and fruity. But um, you know, it's it's appealing because you know it's it's perfect wine for brunch or for cocktails or for lunch or whatever so you know there's definitely a place out there and i think that's why it's become so popular um i just read a statistic they started in 2019 was the first vintage really that was able to produce um uh, prosecco rosé but guess how many and and they produced i think overall the production was somewhere around four million five million bottles of wine how many bottles do you think they're going to produce in from the 2020 vintage you said four million but did in 2019 yeah okay all right all right um Remember, it's a popular category. It can. How popular is it? Uh, I'm gonna guess. Well, you got prosecco and rosé. Yeah. All right. Let's go. 12 million. Yeah. So you want to like uh, triple, almost quadruple that. So 40 That's to 50 million insane. in 2020 is the expectation on rosé. So there's a big million. expectation yeah. by the producers here um, on the popularity and and uh, what's gonna go on with prosecco rosé. So all right, I don't want to sell prosecco rosé too much today, but I thought it was kind of cool and it's definitely. Um, Definitely a new wine, new category, and I'll put a link below to uh, to the wine that we're tasting today, um, and also the, the 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 consortium, so you can see some rules and kind of check it out if you want. All right, let's move on. Prosecco yeah. rosé, probably coming to a wise old dog near you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, and they sent me a nice little uh, luggage tag for my luggage, which is not really working right now. There's moment. no yeah. There's no traveling right now, so you know. All right, grab three glasses, Tom. Let's do it. All right. So our main uh, main thrust of uh, conversation today is going to be about Cabernet Franc, and specifically Cabernet Franc from the Central Loire Valley. Um, and we're focusing on three kind of key appellations or wine regions in, in the area of um, the Central Loire. The first is from Chinon, which is probably one of the more uh, recognized and accessible regions that we're gonna I'd find here. So. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. probably- I say, I say Chinon and most people kind of like, 
get it. Right. Yeah. So they've, they've at least heard of it. Um, it's right. right next to Vouvray, which a lot of people are familiar with, with from, from white wine with Chenin Blanc. Um, and uh, kind of goes hand in hand with that. The next one, actually moving just a little bit to the west, uh, uh, yeah, west, is Bourgai. Bourgai and St. Nicholas de Bourgai are appellations that sit uh, just downriver and on the northern side of the Loire River, but just downriver uh, as you head towards the Atlantic from Chinon, also Cabernet Franc. And then uh, the next one is actually Saumur and uh, Saumur Champagny, um, which is just a little bit farther to the west. And we've got three great producers. So you know these wines. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the first one and pour yourself a glass. Uh, Bernard Baudry, uh, been around for quite some time, uh, classic Chinon producer, I would say, uh, and also, um, here in Connecticut, imported by, uh, Louis Dresner, but in other parts of the country is brought in, uh, by Kermit Lynch. Uh, Le Col Guillot is, um, wonderful. This is going to be, this is going to be one of the wines that is coming off of, uh, just above mid slope. Um, this wine is, uh, a hundred percent Cabernet Franc. Uh, You're really still talking about this one. You're not talking about this one. No, hundred percent Cabernet okay. Franc. Uh, on that, I know I was staring at that bottle. Um, just making sure. just checking. yeah, uh, um, all organically done, very small, um, producer uh and i believe I'm, I'm i'm forgetting my facts here on whether or not it is a uh i believe it is a mark baudry was, was taken over I, i'm kind of blanking at the moment i'll put a link in the uh, oh, we'll link below in the and yeah. uh, we'll put all the bio background so um so audrey and then domaine de la boot yeah domaine de la boot jackie blow um really really wonderful uh this is going to be uh your um, Domaine de la Butte, which is going to be bottom of the slope, also uh, 100% Cabernet Franc. We're in Bourgai, uh, really delicious, and he makes some really wonderful Chenin. Yep. Um, and then there is going to be the Domaine Filatru. Yeah. I actually visited Filatru a couple of years ago um, and uh, took a ride. In the, uh, uh, Frederick came and picked me up in the morning at our hotel, at my hotel. And we went and visited uh, his, his uh, basically his home where his winery is yeah. and vineyards and whatnot. Um, classic kind of country setting and just just really pretty wines. I like that. So a couple 2019s, which are really super fresh, and you can actually we'll talk about the color in a second, but just explosive with color. And a 17 on the on the first one over here on the right. So I think we're probably going to move this way when we when we eventually taste them. Um, just a little bit on Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc as a grape variety is a very old grape variety. In fact, um, most of, do you, actually, do you know where Cabernet Franc, they think it really originates from? I do not, no. We'll take a guess. Well, where is it sort of, where do we know it from besides, well, the Loire Valley? Well, I was, well, was going to say, I mean, Bordeaux. Right. Right, because that's where it's predominantly a blending grape. Yep, so, exactly. So yeah. it's used a lot in Bordeaux, of course. Um, but I think you actually go, you keep going farther south into the west into Spain. And it's, uh, it's probably genetically coming from vines that, uh, and we're going back here um, probably more than 1,500 years probably. Okay. Uh, but northern Spain and really in the Chocolate region, actually, there's some grapes that are really? be its ancestors. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So, um, so pretty cool history. Um, obviously spread north into France and uh, first really major region is, is obviously Bordeaux. Yeah. Um, and then the Loire Valley where it's had a home for, for many, many years. So um, one of the things that, that I always kind of pick up when I'm tasting Cabernet Franc is um, it's the similarity to Cabernet Sauvignon, of which it's a parent. Um, and so Cabernet Sauvignon was um, sort of the offspring of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so it's much younger grape. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the origins of Cabernet Sauvignon kind of date back to um, the 1600s. Okay. Um, so only about four or 500 years. Um, but Cabernet Franc has sort of the similar flavor characteristics that Cabernet Sauvignon has in the dark black, Black, dark fruit, like red to black fruits, um, some tannin, smooth texture, and also a little bit of that um, sort of herbaceousness or, or spices, sort of pepper. For sure, yeah. Pepper. Uh, spices, but the but the bell pepper kind of quality sometimes yeah. come through. I find that there's a lot of sometimes graphite or lead pencil kind of flavors that come through here, which is yeah. sort of similar to that. Um, so we'll see, see in a second when we taste these wines. But, um, you know, that's that's kind of the That's always nature. one that I always forget to use, pencil shavings, you know. Yeah, it's kind of an odd one. Yeah, it is very odd. But, right. you, but you, you smell these wines, and I know because I had a bottle of the filter the other night, and that to me definitely has um, some of those aspects in there. 
and you put your nose in the glass right away. It's almost like a woody kind of pencil graphite kind of smell to it a little bit. Um, and then Cabernet Franc has been spread around the world. It's uh, it's kind of followed and been paired and grown with Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, where it's a natural blending partner in places like Bordeaux. Um, usually used to a smaller degree to add a little bit of extra dimension, sometimes to, to soften the Cabernet Sauvignon, which can be right. full and grippy, um, just adding complexity. Uh, but here in the Loire, we're tasting three examples that are basically 100%. 100%, yeah. yeah. So let's, let's taste them. So Filetro, this is Samuel Chimpany. What do you smell? It's good to, good to fill the video with <laughs> not dead air. It's great. Turn you off right now. Uh, what do you smell for fruit? Black. Black. Black currant. Black currant. Okay, cool. How about non fruit things like herbs or spices? Uh, I don't. Nutmeg. Nutmeg. Okay. So do you get the? I get the nutmeg thing. Do you get kind of that like like pencil? Yeah, like pencil quality? almost like. And there's also like a like a licorice kind of quality licorice, to it as yep, well. Like yeah, that too. Yeah. All right. So before you taste it, let's work on down the line here. What do you smell? Oh, that's uh. I mean, I mean, if that's if that's not like that's my old friend if Brett. That's not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, barnyard. Uh, so a little funky here, for sure. Uh, but underneath that is a is roasted more of pepper, kind of roasted yeah. pepper. But I think you get a lot more of that kind of black fruit and everything that's Absolutely. underneath there. So so real pretty. And again, the color on these wines because they're nineteen is almost like electric purple. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's super hot pink. Although the third one hasn't really lost its color too much. Either. No, not at all. Sticky. First one, uh, actually, Filtru, um, not classic to their style. On this bottling, they did not do any filtration whatsoever. Right. So I feel like that's very apparent in the glass when yeah. I don't know if you guys can see it. But. I, I think you're going to find that these producers across the board, in fact, there's a little bit of sediment built yeah. up in this bottle, are probably very minimalistic. This is a region that... Um, you know, uh, is, is a big player in the natural wine movement. There's Massive a lot of, player, a lot of uh, thought into how the folks are growing their grapes and their vineyards and how they're maintaining them. And, um, you know, whether it's biodynamic or, or, or organic, um, almost across the board, you have producers here because they're relatively small, higher quality producers. Um, there's, there is large kind of production here, but generally speaking, I find it's a, it's a patchwork of small, high quality, forward thinking producers that are making really kind of cool wines. Um, and because there isn't like a massive global demand for them, although there has been more of such in the last few years, right. um, they're not really under huge pressure as, as, a, as a huge area to produce just massive amounts of like cheap plonk wine. Although there is inexpensive wine grown in the Loire, of course. Yes. But you know, it's in the third glass. Whoa. Yeah. Oh boy. I think you get it magnified there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Brett's, Brett's put on a little weight, had a couple years to age. So what we're talking about is Brettanomyces, which is a, a bacterial infection that can cause um, a little bit of farmyard kind of flavor, a little yeah. bit of animal flavor. Um, some people feel it's appropriate in their wines and part of the terroir or the regional distinction of their wines. Other people find it to be a fault. I'm a little susceptible to the aromatics. I kind of pick up on it a lot. Yep. Um, I find it okay in small doses, but if it's like dominating things, I'm not as keen on it. We had a similar conversation earlier in the week uh, Brian stopped by the shop and we tried out the um, Brunelli uh, Rosso del Montalcino. And the first thing Brian said as soon as the glass got up to his nose was, whoa, Brettamyces, there we are. So, yeah. All right, so it's definitely there. Give him a quick taste. These wines are, uh, you know, tannin-wise, acid-wise, these wines kind of, I find, have a little bit more juiciness and acidity than Cabernet Sauvignon. But tannin-wise, they're a little softer. There's tannin here, but it's silky smooth. It's almost kind of like there's a there's a really like mint, um, like a mint leaf character coming out of the the mandula boot. Right. Um, the tannins I find are almost a lot like what you might get from really good Pinot Noir. Sometimes they're silky smooth. Right. They're not too dominant, not too crunchy, not too intense. So. Yeah, so the first two wines, I find these to be fairly similar. Um, really good fruit expression. The fruit lingers and lasts pretty well. Um, there's a little bit more of that funkiness in the second one, um, Domaine de la Boot, but it goes away on the palate. The Brett goes away on the palate. So you get more of that kind of black fruit, almost like cassis, blackberry kind of quality. 
Um, and then of course you still in both wines have that sort of like blackberry leaf where you said mint leaf, a little bit of graphite, um, but it carries forward really elegant, really well balanced wines. Third wine, maybe a little bit of like a eucalyptus on mm -hmm. wine number two. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'd be careful with that one in that eucalyptus is so unique as an identifier. Right. I'd rather stick with your mint. I see what you're saying. It's got that herbaceousness and, and um, minty. Yeah, it's like mint. It's like spearmint. I like that better. Pretty cool. Super soft. Makes your mouth water a little bit, but doesn't linger too long. Nice and fresh. Um, good acidity. Right. Taste the third one. You taste that? No, not yet. The cool Loire climate really shows in all of these. Yep. Of these today. Well, the cool climate, the Loire Valley, you know, it's it's this area as we get towards the western side of the Loire, um, you get closer to the Atlantic Ocean where the temperatures are cooler, um, and that helps to kind of preserve acidity in these wines. Cabernet Franc is a grape, ripens, uh, starts to um, butt a little bit. I mean, you know, the buds come out a little bit later, um, so it's not as uh, it's not an early budding grape in the season. Uh, Mid ripener ripens typically a little bit before Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so in a cool area like this, where it's getting to its r proper ripeness a little bit earlier in the season, being in a cool area, they may not be under pressure because of um, uh, fall to, to harvest right away. They yeah. can actually let the grapes hang on the vines for a little bit longer um, at ripeness and develop color, which we're getting a lot of here, and also aromatics, um, which, are, which are nice and, and definitely coming through here uh, without developing huge amounts of tannin, because if you're in that cooler part of the climate of the season, then you're not going to develop thick skins as much, which are going to build tannin. Which one do you like the best? Uh, there's a lot going on here, and I feel like yeah. uh, it's a lot to unpack, and that, that bad boy might just need some time to kind of sit on the table and, you know... Uh, it's a little funky. Sh sh shake off a little bit. Yeah. Um, the uh, La Grande Vignol is... Uh, really really dialed in um and just great on a on like a fresh full cork uh i think it's wonderful um uh very like bright and kind of uh almost like light on its feet compared to um the board guy which i think is a little bit more serious yeah. of a wine um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna pick favorites yet but i think um i think i'm going towards my uh my serious friend in the middle here okay Monsieur fair uh, enough Jackie Blow. yeah no, no nothing wrong with that wine i think the um you know, the, in Bourgai, you have uh, a little bit more uh, clay, I think, in the soils, yeah. although you're in the Loire here. This is, in fact, on filter, they put it right across the label. This is the, the home of this, this massive uh, chalk shelf that um, uh, they, they actually dig and have over centuries and, and for thousands of years, actually, humans have dug into uh, for caves and dwellings and whatnot. And then they even have modern hotels and, and buildings that are still dug into these uh, hillsides that are made of chalk. Um, and this is actually the place where the term troglodytes come from, because those were the cave dwellers. Right, they're, the yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, they're pretty cool. So a lot of that chalk is in the soil. Uh, Borgai is just up, uh, it's elevated a little bit above the river basin, just slightly, um, and probably a little bit more soil there, not uh, clay soils there. So um, has uh, a little bit more fatness to it. I think that shows through in the wines nicely. So really good examples. I think both of these come through um, with their vintage being just so youthful and young, yeah. really fresh. Yeah, definitely a little bit more layered fruit here. Um, I'm not sure I, I kind of bounce back and forth between the two because the bread, which isn't too bad, especially when you get to the palate, kind of adds and blends with that spiciness right. a little bit. It's nice. So, cool wines. All right. You go to the store, you're going to buy something to pair up tonight with your Cabernet Franc from Lower Valley. What are you buying? What are you going to make? What are you going to eat? What am I going to make? Oh, boy. Um... That's a great question. Uh, I probably, I mean, I like super simple foods. Uh, uh, Ethan cooks a ton, so something like uh, maybe even, you know, like pork tenderloin, we can go in that direction. Uh, um, any kind of like uh, Asian cuisine, possibly, even with okay. these, uh, just to get a little bit different, um, would be kind of fun too. What would you do? Well, the other night we had a, a bottle of the filtro and we actually made some, uh, we made some pad thai, basically. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that was the best pairing. I think the spiciness um, perhaps kind of kind of crushed it a little bit and took away the fruit 
because there's no sweetness, these are dry wines. Um, I think the pork tenderloin option would mm -hmm. probably be pretty good. Yeah. Lean cut of meat, depending on how you dress it. If you just did it simply with some pepper um, and, and salt, pepper rub, whatever, and then seared it would probably be pretty good. Um, you know, my household is a vegetarian household, so I'd probably actually be looking for some things that were mushroom based, earth vegetable based, um, meaning like root vegetables like carrots and right. parsnips and, some, and potatoes. Um, and, and I think those kind of things would work well. You could also have these with a red sauce, you know, something Italian and whatnot, which would be just fine. That'd be super fun. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Clear the deck. Time for blind. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. So for this segment, Thomas and I have each brought a blind wine, meaning we've got it brown bagged, and we're going to pour each other a little sample and quickly work our way through the lens. And then we will divulge. All right, here, I will. Should we tell them how much we paid for each one? Uh, I, can, I can do that. How much did you pay? Uh, 44. Okay. I'll I didn't pay anything. Okay. okay. All right, cool. It's a sample. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Uh, go for it. What do you got? All right, wow. All right. So, a lot of color here. This is, um, this is pretty intense. And when we know, what we know is when we have a darker color, um, you know, we can kind of start, I think, to jettison a couple great varieties. Obviously, the whole white world. Um, but this color to me is kind of a deep, it's sort of a super deep ruby red color, does not really fade at the rim. So because there's no, because it's in the red camp, I'm going to get rid of the grapes. Typically would be more in the purple world. I think I'm kind of losing just, and I haven't smelled it, I haven't tasted it yet, but I'm probably narrowing myself down to maybe a really high quality since it's $44, Pinot Noir perhaps, uh, could be Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, could be a Bordeaux blend, could also be an Italian like Sangiovese or perhaps Nebbiolo. Putting my nose in the glass. Wow, um, it's not giving up a lot. It's a little dull, but more red fruits. There's a little funk there, but not the Bretomyces funk. It's more like leaf. So maybe this wine's a couple years old. No, no, yeah, okay. Um, a lot of red fruit, like super ripe, almost jammy type red fruit. Yep. Raspberries, super ripe raspberries, tart cranberry, black cherry, a little bit of spice, maybe some whetstone. Getting a little bit of wood influence here, so maybe some French oak or some baking spice type notes. Okay. All right. Am I getting close? Yeah, you're, yeah, I think you're working yourself in the right direction. All right. So on the palate, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this is Pinot Noir. Um, this has sort of that roundness and earthiness, slight cinnamon and, and fresh mushroom kind of quality that I associate with Pinot Noirs. If it was another grape variety such as Cabernet, I'm not getting the bell pepper, I'm not getting the black fruits. Um, if it's Italian, I'm not really getting the acidity. Okay. So I'm thinking more slightly warmer climate, probably, you know, if it is Pinot Noir, probably New World. Um, sort of a little bit fatter on the palate. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm getting a little bit more sort of fresh French oak, but subtle, not too intense, but a little bit of toast and a little yep. bit of spice. Um, if I had to guess right now, which I have to, I guess, um, I'm going to say that this is probably Central Coast Pinot Noir, maybe Santa Barbara Pinot Noir. I don't think it's as big and rich as Russian River. Okay. Could be, could be Willamette. Um, but I think I would expect a little bit more length and sophistication and not so much fatness. So slightly warmer, um, 2017. Got the vintage right. 2017. I didn't get anything else right? Oh my God. I know. All right. What Go do we got? Go for it. Go for it. Oh, jeez. It's got the Pinot Noir bottle. No. Syrah? Garage? Yeah, Syrah. Oh, Crow's Hermitage. Okay. All right, cool. So... Got the fatness, a little bit warmer area. It's actually 2018. So 2018, you didn't right. get the vintage. I'm so Sorry. far off. <laughs> you know, it's funny though, because I would expect more like pepper spice, but it does have pepper spice. Uh, color. You were you were on it with um, 
fruit. I guess you were expecting it to have a little bit more fruit presence. Yeah. Now. I mean, a little bit bigger. It's a little cool, so it doesn't really present as much, but it is 100% Syrah. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of like this fat, round, red fruit kind of Syrah. And there's no, like Crozer Hermitage is in the Northern Road. I would expect this to be, you know, a, have a little bit more sort of pepper spice to it, perhaps. Yeah. And maybe a little bit more tannin. But this is like super, super soft. And um, wow. Okay. Way off by like a million miles there. All right. Let's see what you got there, Thomas. I. Let's, let's see what happens. All right. Uh, Can I borrow that? Uh, Mianetto sheet. Danka. All right. Cool. Um, color is going to be, uh, I'd probably say, you got some pretty dark color here. Uh, so I'd probably say uh, something like either ruby or maybe even closer to like garnet. Um, decently filtered, not hazy. Decent amount of wood presence. Uh, if I was to guess uh, if we are new world or old world, I'd probably go new world. Brighter, talk through it. What are you tasting flavor wise? Uh, red berry kind of fruit. Right. Um, Where's the acidity? High, medium, or low? Uh, I'd probably go uh, medium minus acidity. Uh, not incredibly tannic. I'm going to guess that this is going to be coming from a uh, warm weather climate. Um, I'm going New World. I don't think this is coming from California. Uh, I'm going to guess... There's that, there's that kind of... Um, a uh, little bit of like a, a spicy kind of aspect going on. So um, what, would you, what kind of grapes would you associate that with? Uh, I'm going either uh, South American um, Malbec. I would either, you could, I, would, I would think something like that, or uh, we're either in South America or uh, we're in South Africa. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to guess that this wine um, is uh, fairly young, um, probably 2018, maybe 2019. Uh, I'm going to guess that we are. Okay, so New World, 2018, 19. Yeah. Got a great variety? There's only like a thousand. Yeah, I know. Let's just pick a red one though. Uh... What you have i mean if you're in argentina yep i'm in argentina what's the grape i've got <laughs> you know the state of argentina i'm in argentina i am I think I'm looking at, I think I'm looking at Malbec here. I'm thinking I'm looking at like uh, 2018. And if this probably costs 20 bucks on the shelf. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's my guess. Okay. All right. Go. go at it. Oh boy. Way off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe a little Slovenian Peter Loire. Jesus, <laughs> way off from 2013. <laughs> okay, low alcohol percentage, nowhere near anything what I thought that was going to be. 
that was uh, that was a, f a valid attempt, I would say. But you were you were about as wrong as I was in my way. Jesus. <laughs> so we actually have from this producer uh, at the store. I think we have. They have a Pinot Noir. That wine. It's like they have seven years old. No way. Unbelievable. This is way off. Yikes. I can see how you could guess Malbec because there's a lot of like almost blueberry fruit in there. There is. Yeah. And super soft tannins, um, bright fruit. I mean, this it's, it's like crazy to think that this wine is so Looking, looking back at it. Yeah. But it's, you know what though? There's like this, this, um, this structurally, you know, there's no tannin to it. It's got mid-level acidity, which is kind of strange. It's, for it's also very, it's also very well put together. It's balanced. Yeah, it's, like it's incredibly balanced. Yeah, yeah. But it's, young, younger Malbec, I, I feel like wouldn't wouldn't have the structure yeah. or um, you know musical notes. Wines have notes, right? Um, and this is just kind of a free flowing, like very beautiful from beginning to end. No, and the finish is quite so spectacular too. Yeah, absolutely. Real pretty wine. All right, so we'll put all the all the wine notes. I'll put links to the wineries down below. And um, you know, I think one of the great things about tasting blind. Slovenian Pinot Noir. Well, it's Movia. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Slovenia is <laughs> supposed to be like crazy enough. It's supposed to be like one of the most beautiful places to go visit. Cool lifestyle, everything else. And and also, you know, with with Movia and a few other producers, you've got a, a region that produces also. Um, natural wines, orange wines, mm -hmm. um, historic wine, historic wine production. You've got producers here who have kind of gone and researched and looked back at how wines have been made. And in some cases, because these were part of the old uh, Soviet bloc or Eastern European bloc, you know, winemaking techniques and modern equipment did never, n didn't really come here right. until, you know, the fall of, of the wall and, and the fall of the, the Soviet uh, 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 conglomerate. And you ended up with some of the older techniques and and processes really just being kind of consistently produced in the household for many many years. Um, so a lot of these guys have have maintained their sort of traditional and natural winemaking processes all the way through. Where in other parts of the world they're starting to discover or rediscover these natural winemaking processes. So Moby is definitely um, somebody who produces wines in a more sort of traditional and, and uh, almost ancient kind of way, um, but with Really spectacular it's, results. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now the ancient kind of way is the yeah. cool way. It is sense, cool, way. right? Yeah. What's 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 old is new. What's old is new. All right, which was perfect for dry uh, try January. Try so, January. So screw dry January. Go out, get yourself a bottle of wine or something else, and and try it. And we've we've I think kind of hit on a bunch of new things here. Whether it's rosé prosecco, um, uh, wines from the Lo uh, the Loire Valley with the Cabernet Francs. Wines from the Rhone Valley with the Syrah, and wines from Slovenia from Moria. So, pretty cool. <laughs> Rock and roll. All right. All right. Yeah. Cool. That was fun. Yeah. We'll do it again. Yeah, I got to get that down. The Slovenian Pinot Noir. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? I'm going to have fun drinking that later, though. Yeah, I'm going to take that Syrah. That's fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, dude. Cheers. That was an end scene. An end scene. All right. God. You were like, hey, what's going on with Bernard Baudry? And I was like, I forgot. <laughs>